Good evening, church. Um, Today's Bible reading will be from James chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. It's James 4, 1 to 6. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says, without reason, that the spirit he caused to to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is God's word. This evening, it's like a shotgun. Uh, should be sorry, I'm just getting organized. It takes a while. Kathy says it's because I'm getting old, but um, I normally just ignore her. All right, let's pray and ask that the Lord would help us to understand and also apply his word. Let's pray. Our Father, we come before you this evening recognizing who you are, and who we are in relationship to who you are. We are dust that has a life breathed into it. Our very breath is dependent upon you. And we thank you that you have, in your grace, sustained us over the last week that we could meet here again this evening. We want to take nothing for granted in this life, for everything is a gift from you. And we know that you are an incredibly generous God. You do not treat us as our sins deserve. But instead you exercise mercy upon mercy upon mercy towards us. So we give thanks to you that we are here tonight. But we also acknowledge that being here in your presence tonight is because you have brought us here. And even though for some of us we may be thinking about what lies ahead, we ask that you would, for these few moments, enable us to concentrate on what you are saying. This is your word. This is your people. And I pray that you would speak through the power of the Holy Spirit this evening so that we might know that we have had an encounter with the living God. For Jesus' sake. Amen. The TV is my shepherd, I shall not want. It makes me lie down on the sofa. It leads me away from the scriptures. It destroys my soul. It leads me in the paths of sex and violence for the sponsor's sake. Yea, though I walk in the shadow of my Christian responsibilities, there will be no interruptions, for the TV is with me. Its cable and its remote control, they comfort me. It prepares a commercial before me, In the presence of my worldliness, it anoints my head with humanism. My coveting runs over. Surely laziness and ignorance shall follow me 
all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of watching TV forever. Now someone's obviously penned that and taken the 23rd Psalm and just inserted sometimes where we are as Christians. Now I know it's quite confronting at one level, isn't it? And none of us, in a sense, almost want to confront stuff like that. It's easier just to keep it at, at palm's length, at arm's length, and say, well, it's out there. Now, you could swap the TV for games, because games has become more pre prevalent today as well. And yet it's so easy for us to allow ourselves to slip into a sense of worldliness without realizing the subtlety of how we have descended into that worldliness. And you know, when we come to church like this in an evening or a morning or we go to Bible study, whatever the case may be, we might kind of think that somehow we are a little bit insulated from that. It doesn't really affect us. But if God could, for a moment, put us in the spotlight and put us up in center stage and on that big screen there, begin to flash on that screen what we've been thinking of the past week. How many of us could stand here with confidence saying, bring it on. Let everyone see. I'm quite happy for my thoughts to be exposed. And when we think about it in those terms, it's quite sobering to realize that in spite of the fact that we are here, in spite of the fact that we are Christians, in spite of the fact that we serve God, we never reach the point where somehow we think we are immune from the influences of the world. And therefore, it's important for us to constantly be asking ourselves the hard questions and constantly be bringing our lives under the scrutiny of God's Word and allowing that Word to penetrate into the depths of our being and confronting ourselves with the spotlight of God and being willing when He shines it on those areas in our lives that need some adjustment to have the courage, firstly, to admit that we need to adjust and secondly, to be proactive in making those adjustments. Now, James is writing to a church, right? He's not writing to non-Christians. And you read that and you, you think to yourself, hang on, does this fit in a church? And what it says to you is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ back in Paul's day and James's day and Peter's day is no different from the church today. We've always had our struggles, haven't we? The world has always sought to make inroads into the church. We have always needed to keep an eye on how we're doing in terms of our spiritual walk with God. And it's so easy for us to get led astray and think in terms of how others are led astray rather than how we may be led astray. And this confronts us with the pitfalls of worldliness that you and I need to take into account. Firstly, worldliness results in conflict with others. Worldliness results in conflict with others. Thanks to Russell who did my PowerPoint again. It's easier for him to do it than me because he's far more skilled in this. That's his area of giftedness, one of his areas. James uses strong words. I want you to hear the language because I think it's, it's careful, we, rather, we need to be careful that we don't water down the strength of the language he uses. What causes fights and quarrels among you? There is no church that is immune for, from fights and quarrels, is there? Every church I've been at, whether it's been a pastor or whether it's been as an ordinary church member, has experienced conflict, disagreement, and people leaving as a result. Every church. And James understands that's one of the dangers we suffer as a church because... You've got a group of diverse people, diverse culturally, diverse 
ethically, diverse age-wise, who all come together with differing ideas, differing ways of how we think things should be done, and inevitably are going to clash in some of those things. It's inevitable. And the issue is not that we have the disagreements or that we have the fights. It's how we deal with it that becomes important. And there's a godly way of doing it and there's an un ungodly way of doing it. And sadly, we've seen both at this church. So James uses strong words to convey his point with regards to fight and quarrels. Now, those two words are military words. It refers to a, literally, a military conflict where in, there, there is in the, it, it's in the heat of the battle and the conflict has escalated to the point at which people are losing their lives. Now, he's not saying that, that fights are resulting in that. I mean, there's some commentators who argue and say, well, the fights were actual, literal fights going on in the church. I don't think James is speaking quite like that. But the words that he uses are met metaphorically to be understood as ugly verbal disputes where people are fighting with each other. They disagree on certain things. And rather than resolving their disagreements in a godly manner, and Jesus has set that out in Matthew 18, we know how to sort out disputes in the church. They form groups and they end up having these groups that support them and end up in these conflicts and division is the result. Sound familiar? That's the church of Jesus Christ in James' day. It's detrimental to its witness. These people are at war with each other. Cannot come to an agreement on certain things. And so he addresses it. What is the cause of your fights and quarrels? And we'll come down, uh, we'll come back to that. The sad thing about what's happening in, in the church to whom James is writing is that these are a group of Christians who are bought with the precious blood of Christ. Jesus shed their blood for them. He paid the ultimate penalty on the cross. He died for them. And Jesus declares in John 13 verses 34 and 35, a new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Now, here's the crux. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 4 verse 8, love covers over a multitude of sins. But that's not what's happening in this church. There's division, there's quarrels, there's people unwilling to budge. And there's internal strife. And sadly, it's creating disunity in that church. And so James addresses this in very strong language. When our boys were younger, sorry, boys, I'm going to embarrass you a bit now. When our boys were much younger and they were growing up, in every family, unless there's an exception here, if there is, please come and tell me you were an exception because you need some counseling for lying. But in every family, there's conflict. Not so. Every family. Brothers and sisters fight. Brothers and brothers fight. Sisters and sisters fight. Now, it doesn't mean that that conflicts all the time. For most of the time, they got on really well with each other. And it was punctuated most of the time, because I work from home, by raucous laughter, and I always used to think, what's going on? But occasionally, they would fight, and they would get upset with each other, and it was over a toy, or over who got to 
be the batsman in the back garden instead of the bowler because no one likes bowling and, and you know, it, it, just over stupid little things. And Janice and I used to go to them and one of the things we would say to them, I don't know if they remember this, is you brothers, you love one another. Why are you fighting? Do you love one another? You brothers, you family. It's not the church of Jesus Christ family, is it? Are we not brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ who has brought us and bound us together through the shed blood on the cross, the greatest sacrifice of all? He died so agonizing a death that we might be one. Listen to his prayer. That all of them, John 17, 21, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am, am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus prays for the oneness of his people. Division never comes from God. It always comes from Satan. And it's a result of allowing ourselves to respond to ungodly desires within So when you disagree with someone in the church, when you have a verbal difference of opinion, never ever allow that to become a point at which you divide. It's not biblical. It's not Christian. And it's a mark of ungodly worldliness. If the church of Jesus Christ cannot learn to get on with each other and live together with diversity of people, what hope is there for the world? There's none. We have the Holy Spirit. So can I encourage you, don't ever allow a disagreement to cause division. Why does it happen? Well, secondly, because world, worldliness results in conflict with self. Uncontrolled desires are the source. Look at verse 1b. He tells you. They come from your desires that battle within you. Now, the conflicts of the desires there, that word, you all know that word in the English, all of you. It's where we get our word hedonism from. Hedonism is the seeking of gratification of self at all costs. Everything I do is oriented towards me getting maximum pleasure out of this life. And no one is allowed to interrupt me in getting that pleasure. And I would do whatever it takes to, do, uh, to, to get that pleasure, that maximum enjoyment. And hedonism simply puts self at the very center of everything. And everything revolves around me and maximizing what I want. My desires prevail. And everyone else's desires are subverted to making sure that my desires are realized. It is the chief goal of life. Inwardly, these desires are in all of us. We're all self-centered, unfortunately, because of sin. And it's these desires, when they are allowed to fester in ourselves, allowed to grow, and we feed them. And then those desires become overpowering, where they, in a sense, almost overwhelm us and, and, and spring to the surface and come out because it's my way. My will prevail, not God's. The desire for lust, for power, for popularity, for authority, for recognition, for prominence, or of in the soul of these people. And now they've come to the surface. And they dominate their relationships. They're prepared to do whatever it takes to get what they want. 
as long as their desires are met, people can be trampled all over. And it doesn't matter the casualty rate that occurs. Now, please don't misunderstand what's being said here. This is not a dispute over theology. This is not a dispute over scriptural truth versus heresy. This is a dispute over preferential desires. Wars start from that, don't they? Not being able to get our own way, being in conflict with another country, wanting Laban's realm, living space, said Hitler, not satisfied with the space that Germany had. Eventually a war sprung up and 52 million people were dead at the end of it because of hedonistic, uncontrolled desires. There's an interesting little story told by novelist Alexander Dumas. I don't know if any of you have read any of his novels. I have. Alexander Dumas had a heated quarrel with a rising young politician. The argument became so intense that a duel was inevitable. Since both men were superb shots, they decided to draw lots, the loser agreeing to shoot himself. So next time we have a dispute, we'll get two guns, we'll put it on the chair, and we'll have a duel. And whoever loses, well, off you go. Dumas lost. Pistol in hand, he withdrew into a slightly and in, in silent dignity to another room, closing the door behind him. The rest of the company waited in gloomy suspense for the shot that would end his career and life. It finally rang out. His friends ran to the door, opened it up, and found Dumas smoking revolver in hand. Gentlemen, a most regrettable thing has happened, he announced. I missed. But can you believe that a conflict can get so out of hand that it could have possibly resulted in the death of someone? That's why Jesus gives us a way in which we deal with conflict when it arises in the church. That's why he gives us a methodology of resolving and sorting it out. So we don't allow that overwhelming sinful desire to want to get our way all the time to dominate. Secondly, unfulfilled desires are causing havoc. Look at verse 2a. You want something, but don't get it. You want something and don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. That's strong language, don't you think? Now, there's some disagreement among the commentators about whether or not that's actual killing. There's some who, th who think because of the zealot movement, the Jewish zealot movement around there, and we've got a lot of Jewish Christians in this church, that this is actually resulting in actual murder. However, it's, it's, it's inconceivable to think of Christians murdering each other over conflict. So it's probably not what the emphasis is, though I think there is a little bit of open-endedness in the sense that if those desires are left unfulfilled and are not controlled and are not submitted to God, it could eventually end in something like that. But I don't think that's what's going on in the church. Again, he's using strong metaphorical language to try and convey the sense in which these conflicts have got so much out of hand. It's a serious situation that they've got. The, the negative desires, they, 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 in their minds, they would like to see the person literally dead. Have you ever thought that of someone? Have you ever in your mind thought, oh, I was so-and-so was just dead because you've had a quarrel or fight or argument 
I know that kids sometimes in frustration when they're growing up because of discipline imposed by parents might shout out something, I wish you were dead. Our boys never did that, thank goodness. They may have done it silently. But that's the sentiment here. And they covet. The coveting here is they, they want what others have. They, they, they are prepared to go out of their way to try and get what others have. Coveting can end in all kinds of pain and sadness. Remember David when he's out on his roof in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 following, and he's out, he should have been out to war. That's when kings go out to war. He's not. He's out on the roof. He's looking out. He sees Bathsheba bathing in the distance. And he's so attracted to this woman who we are told in Scripture is very beautiful that he sends out one of his servants and says, get her for me. He covets another man's wife. And he brings her into the palace. And then he sleeps with her. And having uh, slept with her, he finds out a little later when she sends him a message to say, well, I'm pregnant. And so David says, well, the easy way to get rid of the baby is by getting rid of the husband. And that way uh, I can marry her. And, you know, whether or not she got pregnant almost straight away after we got married, who's going to count the months? And so he summons his commander of the army, says to him, put her husband on the front lines. Achan, put him on the front lines. And he says, but if you put him there, he's in danger. doesn't matter. You put him on the front lines. He does. He gets killed. David marries Bathsheba, and he thinks he's covered up the sin. But he hasn't because God's seen it. That's coveting. Coveting another person's wife or husband Coveting another person's possessions. Coveting another person's intellect. Coveting another person's good looks. Coveting another person's job. Coveting their personality. There's so many different ways that we can covet. Coveting their nice house and one day thinking, oh, I hope I get a nice house like that. Very easy to covet as Christians. And he deals with it. And he says it's those evil desires. Now, coveting is just a sample. It's, it's, it's not as if James is, is trying to name all the things that create evil desires. But these are the prominent ones that are surfacing in that church. Have you coveted something that someone else has? Have you obsessed over wishing, longing for what they have and think it's unfair that you don't have what they have? Have you in your own mind, even if it's for a fleeting moment, wish that someone was dead because of what they said to you, how they hurt you, things they did to you, maybe an abusive parent? Maybe a bad breakup in a relationship. Maybe a, some bullying that you experienced when you were at school. Maybe some cyberbullying. Thirdly, ungodly desires are selfish. Look at verses 2b to 3. You do not have because you do not ask God. I mean, you do ask God. You do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Now, isn't that interesting? The basic problem here is their own self-centeredness. When it does pray, which is not very often because he says you don't ask, and uh, he says when you do ask, in other words, on the occasion that God, because of these self-centered desires, they want the kinds of things that focus on their desires being fulfilled. And it's the wrong kinds of things that they're praying for when they do pray. And so James says, that's why your prayers are not answered. They're fo so focused on you. They're so grounded in what you want that it kind of takes the will of God and it sets it aside and pushes it to the background and says, it doesn't matter what God wants. It's all about me getting what I want. 
Boy, it's so easy to pray like that in subtle ways. They're self-indulgent. No thought of God's glory. No thought of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he agonized in the garden of Gethsemane and said, not my will, but your will be done. There's none of that in their praying. And so James says, it's not going to get answered. Your motives are perverted. They're wrong. Now, there are some good things to pray for, and Scripture details those things we should pray for. Just read through the, pause of the, uh, the, the prayers of the Apostle Paul, and he gives us some wonderful th- ways in which we can pray effectively. But there are also wrong ways to pray to God. And we should always be examining our hearts and our motives and saying, Lord, what is going on within my heart? Why do I want this particular outcome? Why am I praying for this outcome? Is it ultimately for your glory? Or is it to fulfill some selfish desire that I have? Am I most concerned with seeing your name exalted? Or am I most concerned with getting my way? And then what happens is is prayer is turned into a kind of magic art, you know, and this is done in certain Christian contexts. Name it, claim it. You say it often enough. You pray it often enough. You believe in faith that God's going to give it to you, and therefore you claim it. And as long as you go through the ritual long enough, you eventually are going to twist God's arm into giving you what you want. order to get him to answer, but Baal, of course, is an idol, and Baal can't say anything because Baal's dead. But now we're talking about the living God. We're not talking about some dead, inanimate object. We're talking about the sovereign creator of the universe who has all power in his hands. And we're trying to take that creator and twist his arm and manipulate him and get him to do what we want him to do. And God says, no, 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 no. It's about my will being done, not yours. Oh, that we would come before the Lord and submit our request with that kind of a heart. Lord, I've applied for this particular job and I really want this job. I really like it, Lord. But your will be done. Lord, I'm in a relationship with this guy or girl, and I, I really hope it ends up in marriage. And Lord, please, I, I, I would be so grateful if you end up in marriage, but your will be done. Now, I'll tell you why that's so important to you single young people. Because I, as a pastor, end up having to deal with broken marriages. Where young people got married, looked into each other's eyes with great love, made their vows, and then years later, won a divorce. Make sure it's the right person. Lord, I'm praying for my sick child, my sick mother, father. Lord, heal them. Nothing wrong with asking God. But your will be done. That's much more difficult, isn't it? Lord, do whatever is going to glorify your name the most. That's hard to pray. It really is. When you see someone suffering, and you say, Lord, you know, my heart is overwhelmed with pain because I can see their pain, and how long, O Lord, for you to heal them. But you know, Lord, do what's going to bring most glory to you. Gee, that's hard. But it's biblical. The 
Thirdly, I need to move. Worldliness results in conflict with God. It makes God an enemy, verse 4. Makes God an enemy. You see that? You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. It makes God an enemy. Now, the word he uses there is very apt, adulterous. And he uses that because it is often used in the Old Testament. God often compared his people to a bride who was being adulterous or a husband who was being adulterous towards his wife. And he often talked about the spiritual adultery of his people when they turned away to worship idols. It's rife in the Old Testament and because God has entered into a covenant with us and God calls us the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And so when we stray from his ways and when we allow worldliness to begin to dominate our lives, we are in fact committing spiritual adultery against God. And I know again, because I've dealt with this in marriages, one of the things that breaks up marriages and causes untold hurt and pain and suffering from people is when there is actual adultery. And while sometimes there may be forgiveness for the person who's committed adultery, the scars remain for the rest of their lives. And God is saying to his church, when you allow the world and the world in terms of all its secularism, in terms of all its anti-God stance, in terms of the desires that are sinful, though they may promise certain amount of pleasure, when you allow those things to dominate you and you become immersed in the world so that the world becomes the thing which you are ultimately worshipping, even though you may not overtly worship in a very subtle sense, then you have become my enemy and you are in an adulterous relationship. Boy, that's strong language, isn't it? Their allegiance was to the world, not to God. Worldly things became more prominent, more important. My recreational time becomes more important than serving God. Such friendship with the world is hatred towards God. There's just, there's just no other way of saying it. I, I mean, I wish I could somehow soften the blow here. But how do you soften the blow? Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Hatred. This is James to the church. This isn't James to the unbeliever. You cannot have divided loyalties with God. You cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. One foot in God's camp, one foot in Satan's camp. And somehow expect that God is just going to turn a blind eye and say, you know what, that's okay. You can just carry on operating in that sense. God says, no, I gave you everything. I gave you my son. He sacrificed his life for you. He never held back. Now, when you come to me, you give everything to me. Your life is mine. It belongs to me, not to the world. Surrender to me. Submit to me. Bring yourself daily as an offering to me. One John two fifteen to seventeen. Do not love the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man. The lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father but the world. The world and its desires will pass away, but the man who does the will of God will live forever. Do you get it? Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, Matthew 8, if anyone would come after me, he must what? He must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. When Jesus confronts Peter in John chapter 21, 
And, G- and, and Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? The penetration of those words into the soul of Peter were e- extremely difficult to process for Peter. Because Jesus, in effect, is saying to Peter, if, if you truly love me, you will give everything. Everything. Including your life. Now, for Peter, that did cost him his life in the end. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon, God and money. It's impossible. He makes the point that allegiance to him, it's an all or nothing game. There's no half-heartedness. There's no holding back. There's no hanging on to things that I think I shouldn't have to give away. No, we come to Christ in the words of the hymn writer, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and praise him. In his presence daily live. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move. Always only the impulse of thy love. And so it goes on. (laughs) No half-heartedness here. I get very nervous when I hear people say, I'm more at home amongst my worldly friends than my Christian friends. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. So let me ask you, because God's word deals with this, is your life totally surrendered to God? You bring it under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ as he truly Lord. Are you holding back? Are you and God arguing about something? Are you saying to the Lord, yeah, I'm not sure I can give this up quite yet. It also resists the spirit, verse 5. Or do you think scripture says without reason the spirit that caused now the NRV footnote is accurate here. So if you've got an NRV, read your footnote. Because it's badly translated. Well, it's not badly translated. It's very difficult to translate this verse. So either it talks about the spirit of envy in me or it talks about the spirit of God who is in me, envious of me. And it's that latter sense in which it's speaking. In other words, God has put his spirit to dwell in me. When I allow myself to get distracted and turned away to the world and my loyalties are divided. The Spirit envies after my total loyalty. The Spirit envies after my total surrender, my total dedication. And He works in me saying, but you're mine. You've been bought with a price. Stop hankering after the world. And so when we hanker after the world, we are resisting the work of the Spirit in us. We are pushing Him away. We are saying, no, God. Yes, world. And Jesus is saying, I want undivided loyalty. I wish we had more time there. Thirdly, very quickly, it rejects God's grace. Verse 6. It rejects God's grace. But he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now hear that carefully. The the wonderful thing about scripture is God never asks you to do something that he does not enable you to do. And the problem here is that they are simply looking to their own ends to be able to live in a way that is pleasing to God. And God said you can't do it like that. Don't think that somehow you, by dredging up your own strength and thinking I can do it, I can do it. A little bit like that train, that, uh, that, that kid story about the train that's trying to get up the hill and says I can, I can, I can. 
And, and God says, no, you can't. The only way you can live in a way where you are completely surrendered to me is when you surrender yourself to my grace and when you allow me to infuse by the Spirit of God my strength that enables you in, uh, to live in a way that is pleasing to me. And in order for you to do that, you have to humble yourself before God. Don't you? Because if we think we can do it, that's pride. But when we recognize that we can't do it, but God does it through us by His Spirit, then we humble ourselves and we come to the Lord daily and we say, Lord, we need your Spirit to strengthen us today because the temptations today are going to be numerous. And as we face those temptations, Lord, and as they come to us and assail us, and as they appeal to our inward sinful desires, oh God, by your Spirit, protect us, give us grace, help us to resist, help us to push them away, help us to flee, Lord. Do your work. It's God's grace. It's only ever by God's grace. You know that old story, and I'll close here over time, that old story about Muhammad Ali. Uh, you may have heard it. It's quite a well-known anecdote. When he was on an airliner going, flying somewhere, and he, the air stewardess came up to him and said to him, you need to put your seatbelt on. And Muhammad Ali, that great boxer, said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which the stewardess replied, yeah, and Superman don't need no airplane. He buckled up. It's that sense. You and I are not Superman. But God has superabundant grace. And the power that he has is inexhaustible. And that same power dwells in you by the Spirit of God. So there is nothing that God asks of you that is not possible if we surrender to him and we draw on his strength and we draw on his strength by surrendering to him, by releasing those things to him, by crying out constantly, Lord, help me. This temptation is strong, Lord. It's strong. I'm feeling weak. Have you ever tried to pray when you're feeling tempted? Have you ever tried to look on your phone and look for a verse when you're feeling tempted? I tell you the temptation goes very fast. God's given you everything, everything you need for life and for godliness. You lack for nothing. Don't resist his spirit. Don't resist his grace. Surrender. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we want to be honest before you, not just simply think, you know, this is for someone else. We pray that you would give us the ability to allow ourselves to bring ourselves in submission to your word. And as you shine that word upon our hearts and you expose the worldliness that is there, oh God, give us the grace to surrender it to you. For Jesus' sake. Amen.